Thanks. Uh, uh, Jason um, prepared much of the material you're going to see here today. He's intensely focused on completing his master's degree this semester. <laughs> and so having said that, uh, um, there's been a lot of discussion uh, recently. Many of you may have, have uh, uh, tuned into this for, about soil health. And the, the NRCS does have an initiative right now on soil health. And uh, one of the aspects of soil health that people are, are still grappling with is how do we quantify this? And many of us recognize that, uh, that uh, organic matter is somewhat central to a lot of our soil health discussions. And so Jason's uh, master's research is looking at uh, soil organic matter and trying to assess it in several different ways to see how our management systems are impacting that. So if you were to define what an ideal test might be, it would be, and particularly from a grower perspective, it would be sensitive, rapid, low cost, accurate, and it would be valued because it directly enabled sounder decisions. So using those as some of the, the criteria that we might use to, uh, to take and, and, and measure it to test, these are some things that we thought about from the standpoint of soil organic matter. And organic matter, as I say, is not organic matter, is not organic matter. It's, it's uh, comprised of some very different uh, fractions that have very different functions in the soil. And this is uh, a division that's commonly used today from the standpoint of soil organic matter. You have this active organic matter that readily decomposes, it feeds the biology, and it's in, it pretty important from the standpoint of cycling nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So we're really interested in that bank, if you will, of active uh, soil organic matter. Matter. There's a slowly decomposable uh, uh, a pool that kind of turns over a little bit more slowly, and then there's this kind of passive organic matter that's, that probably has more of a function from the standpoint of cation exchange capacity and, and soil water retention. And you can see here's a diagram in, in terms of, of a pie chart of what some of the, those fractions uh, are in organic matter. Here's a quick history of, of what I would say happened to many of our, our agricultural systems in time from the standpoint of these different pools. So here we are at the beginning in kind of our native situation. And uh, here's the passive, slow, and active pools in terms of what happened after the advent of agriculture. There's a lot of reasons that go into why this decline occurred. But much of that decline, at least from a biological standpoint, happened in these active and slow turning pools. And this passive pool tended to remain more constant over time. It's more difficult to change this, though this did happen in the plus because, as many of you know, we have a, a, a history of soil erosion. And erosion physically moves <laughs> this fraction to other locations in the field. So this complicates the picture from that standpoint. But this is a little bit of, of what has occurred. We've, we've come down to that much of the, the organic matter that we've lost has occurred in these more active uh, pools. And then when we change management and start to adopt different practices, practices that lead to increases in soil organic matter, much of that is impacting these more active fractions of organic matter. So there's a real interest then in focusing in on this active soil organic matter. How do we measure it? What does it mean from the standpoint of our organic matter and our soil's function? So you can look at our soil matter fractions or pools. Here's slow, active, passive, and uh, you can look at different um, ways that we've gone about trying to assess these. There's physical, chemical, and biological ways that we've tried to assess it. Some of them cost differently than others. We've kind of uh, zeroed in on what's called mineralizable carbon, and many of you may have heard about the Selvita test. It's a carbon dioxide, 24-hour carbon dioxide burst that's supposed to be measuring some of this really active uh, soil organic matter fraction. There's also a, a permanent manganate oxidizable carbon, which is a, a simple, fairly simple and inexpensive chemical fraction that tries to get at more of this active but into the slow region from the standpoint of, of organic matter pools. And Coleman came up with this um, hypothesis relating some of this carbon mineralization, one day fractionation, versus this, what I'm going to call epoxy, that's that permanganate oxidizable carbon. So greater organic matter storage, low organic matter mineralization, high stabilization, greater yields leading to high organic matter mineralization and lower stabilization, however. And how do our cropping systems then play out from the standpoint of these two different axes with respect to some of these active pools? And this is what 
research that, that Jason is, has been doing in, in terms of going out to these different sites, Cambridge, the PCFS, near Pullman, Pendleton, longer term sites, the sites at Morrow and at Prosser, the irrigated site, and how this is playing out on these two axes in terms of sea mineralization and this uh, poxy. And you can see, and these, these different um, uh, uh, symbols that you see out here not only represent the sites, but they represent often uh, differences of uh, treatments that are comprised of no-till versus conventional tillage. And also there's an intensification theme in some of these uh, locations. And so this is kind of how that plays out. The winner is the cabbage farm. I'll just say that right away <laughs> in terms of being up here. This is a difference between the, the till versus the no-till. And you'll often find this type of separation that's occurring at some of these locations in terms of where you are in these two different scales. And here's some more just going out looking at the, the no-till versus the till in general and then some of the other treatments. Uh, this is the average. These two dots are the average of where they're occurring. This is the tilled and the no-till of all the sites across here. But this is, again, looking at the assessment of these different um, locations in terms of at least one yardstick in terms of trying to assess this active carbon pool. And here's uh, some work just looking at uh, the carbon mineralization. The 24 hours with the Salvita test, we were interested in exploring, well, is that really telling us and discriminating between these different long-term sites that we're assessing? And we found out that that ne wasn't necessarily the case. And in fact, it took longer to actually find some significant differences in terms of carbon mineralization in some of these mineralization studies going not just from one day, but up to 24 days. Finally, you know, it's not enough to just measure fractions in terms of organic matter. We'd like to know what they're actually contributing to from the standpoint of a, a, a grower's perspective. So linking some of these measures to the soil function or processes is extremely important. And I wanted to just show a little bit of data from uh, from Kirill Kostianovsky's uh, work. So Kirill has been, he's in the monitoring uh, portion of it, but the same sites that we, that Jason took all his measurements from, we also took the chambers out to. These are automated chambers. They basically uh, um, are, are controlled in terms of their opening and closing by a computer. And when they close, the gases accumulate in the chamber itself. So we get a measure then of flux of gases, in this case carbon dioxide as well as nitrous oxide. The chambers close, the gases accumulate, the gases go in these long tubes to these trailers where there's an infrared gas analyzer for the CO2 and a cavity ring down type of analyzer it's from Las Gatas that, uh, that analyzes the nitrous oxide. It, marrying these two systems wasn't easy. <laughs> and I have to thank uh, Kirill Kostiamnowski, Sarah Waldo as well, and the monitoring team for actually being able to link these different uh, uh, kinds of instrumentation together to give us what, you know, real results. That, and there was a lot of calibration with the GC and the lab, et cetera, to make sure that the kinds of data we're getting in terms of the gases uh, was actually accurate. And so this allows us on a small scale to apply treatments. So we can go in on these meter squared areas where these little chambers are and apply water or nitrate or other kinds of, and glucose, we've done all of those at different times of the year to see how these different long-term sites respond. How sensitive are they to stressors from the standpoint of, of uh, in this case, additions of water or nitrogen. Some of the data and how it looks like, and this is the CO2, and this is kind of simulates the CO2 burst of the Salvita. This is dry soil, and boom, we add water and stuff, and this is the where there's no water added. This is a dry site, bam. We, it amazes me how quickly the soil reacts in terms of the biology there. Boom, it's right there. Less than a few hours after applying water, we're already significantly above this dry situation. So the, the soil is alive. It's responding to these stressors that are out there. And this is some of the measures of that. This is going over several days. You see the diurnal cycle of, as things dry out again. That's what you're seeing in terms of carbon dioxide. And some of those accumulations, here's the carbon dioxide at, up top, and we see that the dry site down here, and we see differences in till and no-till up here. But I wanted to say the carbon dioxide differences weren't so striking, but nitrous oxide differences were. And so here, in every case across our dry land sites, the conventional tillage site gave us more nitrous oxide than our no-till site, interestingly enough, despite there being more active carbon in our no-till sites. So this is quite interesting, and we're still waving our hands about what some of this might mean. And the other way that we're assessing things to link it back to farmers is 
evaluating the soil nutrient supplying power. So the same sites, we're, we're applying these anion and cation probes that we can insert into the soil or into the laboratory type of thing. They accumulate different ions. All the macro and micronutrients are accumulated on these that are in the soil solution. And we can start to look at, well, what's, how is this active carbon giving us? And so my time is up. That's what that looks like. And here's recommendations of fertilizer based on those ion exchange membranes, and I'm done. <laughs>